In that name today, that's far above every name in heaven, on the earth and under the earth, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we greet you. We're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We have visitors with us. We're delighted to have you. And we thank God for you in the radio listening audience now tuned in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. And I hope you out there near a phone would call a friend, especially a shut-in friend. Have them to tune in and get this good hour coming up. And I fear we can be a blessing to those out there listening that shut in. And we welcome you. May the Lord bless you. This is Preacher Edward speaking. We're coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church in Athens. I want you to take your Bible now and turn, will you please, to the book of Matthew, or uh, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, page 1004 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. All original Schofield Reference Bibles have the same page numbers, same verse found every time on each one. I'll try to keep a few here in my study in case someone wants to get a Schofield Reference Bible. I always can get it and let them have it about $10 or $12 or $15 cheaper than you buy them at the average place and not in the Bible selling business, but um, I try to accommodate those I can accommodate in that respect. Now, I want to give you some Bible questions on page four of book number three on my Bible questions and answers. Everyone should know I have five of these books. You can get one copy for a $2 gift. You can get all five copies for a $10 gift. And on page four of book number three, you'll find the answer to these questions. What man sent his wife and children back to her father? And when he brought them back to him, he kissed his father-in-law instead of his wife and children. Now, who did that? What man put the blood of war in his shoes that were upon his feet? Who was hid in the house of the Lord for six years? Who slew 70 persons and put their heads in a basket? Where does it say in the Bible a wet cloth was laid over a man's face as he died? What king sent a message to another to come that they might look each other in the face? Where is a college mentioned in the Bible? Where in the Bible does it say that horses were given to the sun? Who kidnapped a boy and hid him six years? What child took his twin brother by the heels while being born? Who kept sheep for a wife? Where did God say he would cast the people's sins in the depths of the sea? What did Hezekiah call the brazen serpent Moses had made? What man had the fairest daughters of any in the land? What special thing did God do with his eyelids? These questions you'll find answered in book number three, page four. If you're interested, you write in. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603. Is the zip code number. Now, this uh, hour's broadcast, the faith broadcast, and I depend upon you that love God to help me take care of the radio expense. Not only do we have an obligation to pay the radio station, but we have an obligation for other expense connected with the broadcast. I'll be mailing the station almost $400 on tomorrow. And we, uh, we do this by faith. We look to uh, God's people, many uh, dear people that just received a low income have a little part in it if they like out in the radio listening audience that gives them a chance to have a part in this whole mission work and in that way we work it together in getting out the gospel now the tape today will be tape number 368 I'm going to speak on the subject blockades on the road to destruction blockades on the Road to Destruction, tape number 368. Now you're ready to get the tape for a gift of $3. I meet people every day, say, Preach Edwards, we most certainly appreciate the ministry, your radio ministry. And a fellow told me the other day, he said, uh, Preach Edwards, said, I, I like to listen to you. So I like those little things you say uh, to hold the attention of the people. And, for instance, he said when you said the other Sunday about 
the man drinking water out of the branch and a bird hunting, he was bird hunting with him and he's drinking water out of the branch and his dog just above him drinking water all at the same time. And uh, he thinks like that, you know, he uh, gets people attention. He appreciated that. And you know, I made mention about two weeks ago about bird hunting in my sermon. And I made mention if some good farmer, good man had a few covers of birds out there and I'm trying to train a little bird dog would let me hunt them. I don't kill enough to miss them, but uh, I would uh, let me know about it because around, right around this area here, you just don't find anymore. There's pastures and posted land and, and trailers and homes and where I used to hunt, you can't hunt anymore because there's no birds there. And uh, this gentleman, you know what he did? He sent me a nice framed picture, a large, beautiful framed picture had uh, Bob White and a uh, mother quail and a lot of little baby quails on it. <laughs> I appreciate that so very much. I cherish that very highly. He heard me talking about the quail, you know, and he sent me that picture by his brother. It's a nice size picture. And then I called him to thank him for what he did. And he said, the preacher Edward said, I got three coveys on my place. I'm going to have to enter into the hospital. And when I get out, you come down to my house and you bring your little dog and I'll tell you about where to go and see if you can't find those three coveys. So I'll have to wait till I hear from him and he'll tell me where to come. And I hope to go and ski a few of them up. Might even hit one when I shot at it. You can't ever tell. But anyway, I enjoyed it. It means a lot to me. My good friend, Brother Joe Brett Wage, is one of the greatest bird hunters I've ever hunted with, hunted regular. He said, Brother Edwards, you'll live 10 years younger if you continue doing a little hunting during hunting season. He said, now I know what I'm talking about. He said, it'll mean that much to your health. And I appreciated that from that kind gentleman. And so, uh, uh, I appreciate these things and a lot of humor I use and a lot of things I say, I do it for a purpose. Kind of like uh, on one of these days I'm going to uh, have to uh, have uh, three bypasses. That's right, I'm going to have to have three bypasses. I'm going to have to bypass McDonald's and I'm going to have to bypass Wendy's. I'm going to have to bypass uh, Hardy's. I'm going to have to have those bypasses because if I don't, I get too fat. And so I have to undergo them. And so sometimes you may have to have a bypass in order to keep from having a bypass, Brother Camel. So you remember that. All right. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. I'm going to read something here that came to my desk about two days ago, and I made mention of this last Sunday, and I'm not making a hobby horse out of this uh, line of thought, but it's so needed, and our young people need to be warned, and young mothers and dads need to be warned about these things, and it's my duty and my responsibility to do it, and I want you to let me have your ears for just a few minutes on this, put your feet right on the floor and look at the preacher. Now, the, the, it's entire statistics that shock, taken from a, a little magazine, a paper, the Maranatha, and this is copied from the Baptist for Life. And now I read, 22,500,000 have died at the hands of the abortionists since the 1973 Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision. Twenty. Two million five hundred thousand. All right, I read on. That number represents the entire population of Minnesota, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and the District of Columbia. Nearly one in three babies in the U.S. is destroyed by abortion. One abortion, one abortion takes place every 20 seconds. That's 4,500 per day, or 1.6 million per year. Over 98% of the abortions in the U.S. are for social and not medical reasons. Abortion is a half a billion dollar industry. 
In the U.S., some abortionists make as much as $2,000 a day. Abortion is the leading cause of death in the U.S. While 99% of the fundamental Baptists profess to hold up pro-life convictions, only 3% are involved in pro-life organizations' activities. Uh, so this source comes from Baptist for Life survey. In 1986, Americans adopted 3 million cabbage patch dolls and killed 1 million six-point babies. Some abo since abortion was legalized in 1973, child abuse reports have in increased 500%. Planned Parenthood, Federation of America, the large tax funding provider of abortions performed 94,000 abortions in its 47 clinics in 1985 during that year. And then the, the Planned Parenthood Federation of America received 30 million in federal title X, fund, X funds despite a federal ban on Medicaid funding abortions under the Hyde Amendment. So you see what you're doing here. You help paying for some of these abortions through your tax money. Now, if that if that don't shock you, I don't know what will. And I felt like it should pass it on to you. It's my duty and my responsibility. And when you begin to think about an abortion, and you know good and well it's not going to affect your health or whatnot, and you know you shouldn't do it, you better be careful. You're going to face God in the day of judgment and you're going to be guilty of committing murder. And if the blood of Jesus Christ don't cleanse you from that sin of murder and killing the innocent babies, you'll find it out it's a judgment. It's a very serious matter. This nation's gone crazy. And do you think God Almighty is going to always put up with this? Do you think God Almighty is going to put up with the drunkenness and the drugs and what's going on in America, the killing, the robbing and the... And the people, the way you see them act and dress on the street, they look so weary, got rings in their nose and chains running from their ears to their nose and, and dress like a bunch of clowns and look like a bunch of idiots parading up and down Boulevard here in Athens and other places, bunch of demonized people, devil worshipers. You think, what's God going to do about that? He's going to send them to hell. He's going to destroy all of this sodomite stuff and and like Sodom and Omar and, and those people that's so foolish to do stupid things like that and look like a bunch of idiots and clowns and worship the devil. God's going to send this gang to hell one of these days. And when he does, it's going to be too late for him to do anything about it then. You may say, preach, I don't like it. Well, God didn't call me to preach what you like. I preach what God calls me to preach and what I feel I should preach, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you can lump it, leave it, leap it, jump up and bump it or whatever you want to do. I'm going to preach it anyhow. Now we come to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Now I want to read a few verses of scripture. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 13. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now the Bible speaks here about a, a destruction road. Many go down the road that leads to destruction. And he said also in the scriptures, many in that day say, Lord, Lord, I opened us. He say, depart from me, you works of nature. I never knew you. And so I want to speak about blockades on the road to destruction. Every unsaved person today that's lost is headed down a road toward destruction. The Bible tells you so. Broad is that road. Narrow is that gate that leads to life eternal. Now you can go down the highways today and occasionally you'll come to a blockade where it tells you you must detour. There's a bridge out. They are doing some constructive work down the way, and you have to go another direction. Now, you can go on down that road, run off into a river, or over a cliff, or run into a hole and commit suicide if you want to. Or you can abide by that sign that says, um, blockade, detour, and be safe. 
Now there's some blockades today on this road to destruction. I'm going to mention a few of them. And you need to heed them because they're on this road. Now I'm talking primarily to you people going down the broad road. I thank God for you that are on the narrow and straight way that leads to heaven. I'm sorry to say today there's a lot of people that think they're on the narrow and straight road to heaven, but they're still on the broad road to destruction. You can't get them concerned about the things of God. You can't get them to read their Bibles. You can't get them to pray. You can't get them to witness. You can't get them to be faithful uh, in serving God. And they say, well, I'm going to heaven. You better check up. You're probably still on the road to destruction because if you're on the straight and narrow road, you're headed in a different direction and you're doing different things and you desire to do different things. You want to do different things. And if you're on the right road, then you'll be doing some different things. Don't kid yourself. A lot of people's going to hell that think they're on a straight and narrow when they're on the broad road to destruction. Now there's some blockades. On this road, I want to pass on to you. Number one, there's a blockade of the will of God. I want that to sink in. I, I have several blockades. I probably won't be able to miss them all here this morning. The Lord willing, probably tonight, I will, I'll go ahead and mention the others if I don't get them all mentioned this morning. But you need to know about them. And no doubt there's many of you out there in the radio listening audience. You're lost. You know you're lost. You was out last night living like the devil, living it up and uh, drinking and carousing and carrying on such so mind and you got a terrible headache this morning because of your drinking or on dope and you know you're on that broad road and you know you're headed toward destruction and one of these days you're going to go in, fall in head foremost and it'll be too late then to get right with God. Now God's will is a blockade on the road to destruction. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, my Bible tells me that it's not God's will for you to travel on down this road to destruction. Now, you know as well as I, the road to destruction leads into hell. You know that. And you'll go into that place and go there without God if you continue down that road. But it's not God's will that you go there. Some people say, well, uh, God knows where I'm going. And if it's his will for me to go to hell, I'll go to hell. If it's his will for me to go to heaven, I'll go to heaven. What is to be will be, whatever happens or not. Beloved, listen to me. The Bible said... That God Almighty said it's not His will that you travel this broad road. Now God didn't create heaven and God didn't create hell just to be uh, doing something to take up a little time and uh, just to, for mere curiosity. Now these jails we have today, they they make those jails and prisons and and the people that build them, they don't rejoice in having to build them. They might enjoy the income they get out of the work they do, but they don't rejoice over people killing and, and robbing and having to be stuck in there. They don't, but they gotta have them. Gotta have them. Now you don't enjoy whipping your children. Now if you're a child abuser and you enjoy whipping your children, abusing your ch children, uh, you, then uh, you, 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 something wrong with you. You're full of the devil. And you need to get right with God. Now there may be a time when your child needs a whipping. I feel sorry for a lot of our young couples today. They don't know a bit more know how to raise youngins. And the child knows when Sunday comes. Now these mothers, these old times that's raised children, could uh, give you some help. The Bible tells the older women to help the younger women. And a lot of young married couples today, they grab a book, or listen to some psychologist, and, and read about how to raise their youngins. You throw that thing in the fire and stay away from those people and get your Bible and get on your knees and talk to your mother and grandmother and some old-fashioned preacher. And the preacher's why they'll tell you how to raise your youngins. 
And it's a shame today that the young couples that have small children that absolutely know nothing about how to rear those children. It breaks your heart. They don't know how to control them. Don't know how to make a mind. Many of them don't make a mind. They don't care. Just let them have the way. And it's, a, it's amusing in a way and sad how well parents mind those little children today. Little Johnny says, I'm going to have it. Daddy said, yeah, if you're going to have it, then I have to get it for you. Little Susie said, I want it, and I want it, and I want it. All right, little Susie, you can get it, whether they need it or not. Now, beloved, there's always a stopping place and a time to say no. Now, whenever we build jails and places like that to confine people, then we don't rejoice over that, but you have to put them there. The state of Georgia and every state today in America needs more prisons Needs more jails. They're having to turn criminals loose now that's in there for murder and uh, crime committed where they got 10, 20 years. So having to turn them out to be able to stick somebody else in there. Keep him in there for a little while. They're going to do more and more of that kind of stuff and turn them loose on the street. You need more electric chairs. You need a good old electric chair in just about every town. And you need a, a prison. And you need to, to work those prisoners and punish those prisoners. Uh, don't let them sit out there and play cards and listen to TV and play the radio and cuss and care on and, and let people slip dope into them and, and have a better time and a better life there than they have at home. No, no. When I was a boy growing up out here in Madison County, they had a chain gang out there. And those jaybirds that stole automobiles and robbed people and killed people and robbed homes and, and, and they committed rape and, and they tried them and they sent them out there. And they put some striped clothes on them. And they put some chains around their legs. And they give them a pick and shove them. And they carry them out about daylight. And they shoveled dirt and picked and dug dirt and hauled it all day long. And about night they got them in. And when they brought them in, they were ready to go to bed. And when those people got out of the Madison County chain gang out there beyond Danielsville when I was a little boy... Well, they, you didn't see them back there as a general rule. No, sir, they didn't more of that. But this thing we got today you call a stockade and a prison. Well, there's people on the outside just eating to get in there. They're overcrowded and they just can't find room for them. They want to get in there so bad because they're a bunch of uh, queers. And they got a queer lover on the inside and they want to get in there. And uh, they know when they get in there and play cards and be fed good food and have a good time and look at TV and live it up. And they can't hardly wait to get back into prison. I know a man some time ago went into a store with his raincoat on, filled all of his pockets full of canned goods. Walked out and him just budging out. Walked right by without paying for him. They stopped and said, man, what are you doing? Well, what he was doing was he, he'd been out of jail and he wanted to get back in jail. And so they uh, took the groceries away from him, carried him on back to jail. Now, you have a lot of that stuff going on today. Now, these uh, crime breakers today and murders and killers and robbers and rapists, they know they're not going to be punished. They're not a bunch of fools in that sense. They're fools in many ways. But they know they're not going to be punished. Until we get to the place where we punish criminals, I mean punish criminals, you're going to have more and more just glad to get in there. They'll commit crime. They don't care if they get caught or not. And uh, they'll kill and, and rape. It doesn't matter with them because they know they'll be out in a little while. It doesn't matter. Take a little vacation. They call that kind of a vacation. And they have it better in there than they have on the outside. And our leaders, our politicians, our officials look to me like we have sense enough to see what's going on and do something about it. But a lot of them are like those bunch of uh, three stooges in Atlanta that overturned the the all-day family case for a new trial. Stooges like that, you know, they don't know, uh, they, they don't know some of them winter and, and which ends up, which ends down. All they know, they're just drawing your money from it as a taxpayer and sitting up there and leaving it up. They aren't, they aren't, they aren't concerned about the mistreatment of law-abiding people. You're welcome. All right, we build the prisons and the jail, and they're put in there to try to curb the crime and try to stop the situation. And so God Almighty said, it's not my will that is your prayer. I built hell. God built hell, a place of torment, and God created the lake of fire. But God did that because he can't carry people to heaven that are not saved. you got to put them somewhere. 
And that's the best God can do for them is stick them in hell and lay it into the lake of fire. But it's not his will. If a man goes to hell, he goes against the will of God. That's blockade number one on the road to destruction. Blockade number two, you climb over the warning of judgment on the road to destruction. There's not a one of you and not a one of you sitting out there in the radio listeners would have heard about judgment. You know what judgment is. You know you have judges and you have people that uh, uh, tell you what rules are and what you abide by. And you, and, uh, but that's coming a judgment for these people traveling down this road. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Man talking to a fellow one time, he said, I'm not afraid to die. He said, you know, no, I'm not. He said, uh, not me, I'm not afraid to die. He said, well, uh, uh, how about facing God in the judgment? Judgment, he said, I hadn't thought about that. Well, people need to do a little thinking. When you die, that doesn't end at all. When you die, you're going to face God in the judgment. It, it's appointed once to die, and after that, the judgment. You're just as certain to face God at the judgment as you are to die. Now don't get around. You can't get around that judge. That's one judge, the just judge, and you're going to get admitted out to you what you deserve when you go to the judgment. Some of these uh, courtrooms you go to today, you have some of these liberal infidel judges and they love the criminals and they liable to let you off at nothing. Now we have some good judges that believe the book and straight and honest and upright. Thank God for them. But you have some that's not worth the salt goes in their, in their bread and you can get by them. But you're not going to get by the judge yonder in, in, in heaven when you face God. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. The wages of sin is death but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there's a wages to be earned and you're going to get those wages if you go on down this road and you're cut off on this road and you don't have a chance to get back to the narrow and straight one, you, you're going to get your wages. And your wages is death, not only physical death, but the second death in the lake of fire according to the Bible. And then you move on down the road to destruction, you run into another blockade. And the other blockade you run into, you, there's the love of God. God Almighty has done everything he's going to do. God's done everything in his power that needs to be done. God had extended his gift from heaven, his beloved only begotten son. God sent him down here to sin cursed earth about 2,000 years ago. God allowed wicked men to abuse him and kill him. They crucified him. God allowed that to be happen. happen. And John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, what more can God do? What more can God do than to take his precious darling son in heaven and say, son, people down there headed down the road to destruction and they, they're going to hell and, and I, I want them to come to heaven. And son, I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to send the best I have. I'm going to send you down there. I'm not going to send Michael. I'm not going to send Gabriel or any other angels. I, I'm going to send you, son. And the son said, Father, I'll go. It's always my desire to do thy will, O God. I'll go. And in due time, the Bible said, in due time, in fullness of time, and Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, that the Savior came born of a woman in due time. Born under the law, they might redeem us from the curse of the law. He, he came on the exact schedule second that God intended for him to come. He was born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger, spent about three, 33 years on the earth. They mistreated him, they abused him, they spit in his face, they slapped him, they plucked out his beard, they beat him. And tormented him, put a crown of thorns on his head, nailed him to a cross, and he died. And God let him do that, and God gave his son to keep you off of the broad road, off the road going to destruction, that you might get on the narrow road and go to heaven. Now that's the love of God. If you know anything any stronger than how God can manifest his love than that, you tell me. Do you know how God, how God could have manifested his love anymore 
than to give his only begotten son and put that blockade up there to keep you out of hell. And you're headed down that broad, slick road with the multitudes. And you realize that Jesus is there to stop you. And there's a love of God. He died for you. And then you go on. You're going to end up in hellfire. Now that's the love of God. That blockade is a strong blockade. And every person that travels the broad road and ends up in the pit goes over the blockade. He go, runs over that blockade. He moves on in spite of it. He runs over it. And he goes right on to hell anyway in spite of all God has done. God has done all he's going to do to keep people out of hell. God couldn't have given anything any greater than his son. He sent the Holy Spirit, and there's the mercy and love of God, the attributes of God, the intrinsic attributes of God, that God has sent and to keep people out of hell. God gave us the Bible, and yet people go right on down that broad road to destruction. And you run right over, right over the love of God. And if you go to hell, you go to hell in spite of God loving you, in spite of God trying to block you, in spite of God trying to keep you out of hell, you're going that way. I'm going to mention one other blockade. The good Lord willing, I'll mention a few others tonight. And so I'm going to mention one more blockade, and that is, if you go down the road to destruction, you're going to climb over the inerrant, infallible word of the living God. Every man that goes down that road, he runs over this book. I'm holding this book out for you to see, and you and the radio listeners can't see it, but you can imagine seeing me here with open Bible, holding it so these people can see it. If you're going down that broad road, this book is standing between you and hell. And you'll have to run over this book. God gave the complete Bible... And when God gave the book of Revelation, he sealed it and said, add nothing to it, take nothing away from it. That's, that's, that's final. That's the final authority for mankind on the earth and for all religion. That's it. God said, I'm not going to change it, I'm not going to add to it, I'm not going to take away from it. That's my book. And God said, if you go down that broad road, you're going to run over this book. You're going to walk right over it, run right over it. It's between you and hell. It's on the broad road that leads destruction. It's there. Now are you going to run over it? Are you going to walk up? Are you going to neglect it and ease right on down that broad road? Well, if you do, you're headed for hell as certain as you're listening to the sound of my voice. God is doing everything he can to blockade people going down the road to destruction. I read in my text where it said the broad road leads to destruction, and many go in there at. What is meant by destruction? Hell, that's what he's talking about. Be, de be destroyed in hell fire. And not the soul, of course, but only the body, and then temporarily raised again uh, yonder uh, to be destroyed in lake of fire. Beloved, not the soul, only the body. Now you listen to me. God has done everything he can to get you to offer that Road to destruction. And if you go on, you blame nobody but yourself. You can't blame God. You can't blame the Holy Spirit. You can't blame anybody but yourself. Now it's up to you. Now let me say this. I close. God Almighty is not going to force anybody to leave the road to destruction and get on the narrow. He's not going to force you to do it. He'll tell you he loves you and he wants you to do it. As his will that you did do it, and he's provided a way so you can do it, and you don't have to go down the road to destruction, but God's not going to hog tie you and buttonhole you and grab you by the whiskers and drag you back to the other road. No, 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 no. God's done all he's going to do to keep you out of hell. And if you go on, in spite of what God's already done, and you go on down that broad road and you end up in hell, and that's what you're going to do, if you don't get off that road, that's exactly where you're going. You can blame nobody but yourself. You can't point your finger at God. You can't point your finger at anybody but yourself. And that's what God said in this book. 
Nobody but yourself can you blame for going to hell. And you say, what a fool I've been. I can't blame. I'll try to blame and pack it on my mother and dad or the preacher or the church or the whatnot. But God won't accept it. You can't blame anybody but yourself. 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 Now, what are you going to do about it? I've given you about four blockades on the road to destruction, Lord willing. I'll give you a few more tonight. Let's stand our feet. Our Father in heaven, we praise your name. We bless your name. Thou art good to us. And Lord, I'm so glad one day that I realized I was on that broad road to destruction. I realized, God, that you loved me and died for me. And I'm so glad, our Father, that I accepted Jesus and got back off of that road, back onto the narrow road. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you. I'll always thank you for it. God, there's some maybe today that's still traveling on a broad, slick, dangerous, icy road to hell. Might slide in at any time. God, help them, I pray. Have your way in this invitation in Christ's name. Amen. Debbie, give us a stanza so of some song. If you're here unsaved, you're here backslidden on God, or you're here, you want to join the church, or you want to re rededicate your life, or for any reason you feel like you'll respond to this invitation, you ought to come. It's up to you. Entirely up to you is what you're going to do about it.